Today we have an incredible guest, Nicole Krenzel, who is the founder and CEO of Black Girl Fest, which is the largest gathering of black women in London, in the UK. Uh, and now it's an international community because COVID brought it online. So they went from a multi-thousand person in-person conference and now a global community with lots of online programming. Nicole's story is an incredible one, one that you hear from a lot of community builders who just went out there to solve her own problem of not seeing enough people like her in the world of tech and culture and art. And so she created this event, uh, expected 300 people to show up, and they ended up with 3,000. So they overflew the venue that they had, and it was just an incredible first event that started this whole new trajectory for her career. Today, she is an angel investor as well. Uh, she was named a Forbes 30 under 30. She's also a LinkedIn change maker in 2021. So Nicole's just an incredible community builder. We talk all about how she built her community up, what that story was like, what were the challenges for her in building that community, as well as what are companies still getting wrong when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. How can you create content that reaches black women and other underrepresented groups? And what can we do moving forward as we move into these exciting new phases of technology and Web 3.0 and all this good stuff? How do we make sure we don't repeat the same mistakes as at, that we did in Web 2.0 around not including the right groups and, and limiting the voices that could be involved and limiting who can be the builders in this space? Hopefully we learn from our past. Uh, this is a super inspiring interview. I learned a ton from Nicole. You're going to really love this one. Let's dive in. Nicole, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Very excited to chat. Uh, why don't we just start with a little bit of background about you, how you got into building community and Black Girl Fest, and how you got into becoming a VC. You have a pretty incredible story. So why don't you just share that and what's the quick version of how Nicole <laughs> got to be today's Nicole? <laughs> Okay, I'll give you uh, the quickest version I've ever given. Um, so wow, I've always I'm been, <laughs> I've always been the kind of person who's been interested by design. I've always been the kind of person who would take things apart just to understand how things work. I've been obsessed with systems and processes and finding new ways and challenges, basically, to completely deconstruct and to challenge and to not allow for the status quo. And I guess that's definitely been the precedent and the, the, the grounding for everything that I've done in my career, all the industries I've navigated, but also the way that I carry myself through those spaces. Um, black Girl Fest was created out of a need to see more black women in having cultural conversations about our experiences, our identity, things that involved us, but never actually involved us at the centre stage. Definitely. That's what we saw in 2016, 17, when I was in the kind of early stages of building community. Um, mm. But I've always been really passionate about finding ways to bring stories and people's identities and celebrating those identities to the fore. Um, in 2016, I did an exhibition and it was really trying to have conversations with other black women about mental health and art and technology mm. and thinking about the ways in which our experiences as women was impacting our well-being and that kind of just like led into such an incredible career working across the arts and creative industries. And I guess I found my way into tech by chance. Um, I, again, have been someone who has always been interested in, like I said, taking things apart and challenging the status quo and finding all my ways into new industries where I felt like there weren't a lot of people that looked like me. And so I had to basically wiggle my way in so there would be someone that looked like me and that person was me. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I, I didn't grow up with, a, with anyone in my family who was an investor or who ran their own business. So, and I come from a migrant working class background and I didn't really have a lot of people who were in this space to really lean from to understand how I would then navigate once I arrived. So I kind of arrived quite blindly. I was just like, what is this interesting, cool tech space and ecosystem that is doing this cool investing thing? And how do I navigate this? And who do I need to know? And it just felt like this whole new world again that I just had to completely like deconstruct, take apart and insert myself into. Um, I'm kind of in favor of always shaking things up, shaking tables and disrupting mm. the status quo. And so wherever I see, I can basically make a mess is where I see room to insert myself. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. 
Um, and and it's interesting, Katas, because a lot of the time when we're talking about the experience of black women or black people uh, on this mm. podcast, it's often been in the context of America, which mm. is its own experience and has a whole lot of challenges that are very specific to the culture here. You're based in London, right? And you were born in Ghana. Yeah. And so that's a that's a unique experience from what it's like to be a black woman in America, but I imagine there's a lot of consistent challenges there as well. Yeah, a hundred percent. There's like several nuances when it comes to someone like myself who migrated to the UK but was born in Ghana and is still trying to navigate the diasporic conversations that are coming from a lot of people in my generation, a lot of millennials who are trying to find themselves within societies that don't necessarily always include them, whilst also still trying to feel connected to the motherland of where they're parents or their birth parents mm-hmm. whatever it may be could is from and I think that's an interesting space to navigate because definitely for black people within the UK um, it's trying to find some form of identity as you would imagine African Americans have done for so many years um, but that history isn't told as well in the UK so it's hard for us to really believe and trace back our roots to some form of identity as being black British and so there's just a multitude of of cultures and identities and ways in which people identify and it's just this hotbed of of culture and conversation that's just constantly happening in the UK and I think that's where I really saw the opportunity for Black Girl Fest because again when we think about Black people we're not a monolith we're not all the same we don't all have the same backgrounds Mm -hmm. but specifically for Black British people there are so many different stories and 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 channels of which people's stories all interconnect, but also all expand. And so that's why I was so interested with like thinking about the experiences of Black Africans and Black Caribbeans, and thinking about um, people of mixed heritage and how their experiences as women across the UK, not just in London, um, differ more widely to like the global experience of of Black womanhood. And um, that's something that I felt like wasn't being explored a lot. A lot of what we understood as womanhood and and blackness is being led entirely by what we see in America. But that that experience Mm. is so different. But those stories are never really told. And so leaning on from what we saw happening in the US, we just thought, you know, what what kind of stories don't get told in black British history? And, And who are the figures that we should be celebrating? And who are the 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 leaders and the pioneers who are really transforming what you know our ancestors have previously talked about and done and how are we using technology in a really interesting way to really push those conversations and that is where Black Girl Fest sits as its own kind of ecosystem its own space where all of this constant culture conversation and creativity is happening in one space. Mm. Do you find it challenging to or I guess how how do you navigate that? balance that I think all community builders have to figure out in terms Mm. of identity within their community of there being kind of an overarching identity that everyone has in common, but then there's sub identities within that. And so how do you facilitate community for black women as a whole and Mm. where there are commonalities in their experience and their challenges? Uh, Or do you, do you also look for opportunities to get much more specific uh, mm. based on where people originally were born or if they're emigrated or they were born in London or the, the unique experiences that people have within the community that may not be the same from fellow members? Yeah, I think for us, we've always found, um, and this is where I think definitely people who work in the DNI space, they're always questioning, like, how have you made your space so accessible and intersectional and and diverse, right? Even just thinking about the Black communities that we inter, inter, in, engage with. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I said to them, it's the programming, it's it's trying to devise programming that actually speak to those intersections in a way that is accessible and inclusive and authentic, which is how we constantly Mm -hmm. feed into those different channels. Um, For us, it's like thinking about the experience of something like I remember we had a panel discussion, which was um, about um, being black, queer and disabled. And how the experiences of exploring your sexuality were so different when you had a a visible disability. Um, And those are the kind of conversations where a lot of people weren't necessarily identifying based on where they were from or their heritage, but about their experiences. Um, And that allowed them to find commonalities as to whether it doesn't really matter if you're Black um, African or Black Caribbean, you all probably had some form of like 
commonality around being black and queer and trying to navigate being also disabled. Um, mm. So it's conversations like that, that you wouldn't really get anywhere else in most event conference programming um, right. that was really feeding into conversations, trends, topics that were coming out of our community and being thrown back at them through excellent programming and speakers and facilitation that allowed them to, again, constantly see themselves being reflected. And because we knew our audience was incredibly intersectional, incredibly intergenerational, it was kind of like a hotbed of like, this is like, I always say like programming for our festival is like the fun part. It's the bit mm. where we get to be completely expressive and we get to throw all these ideas into this one space. Um, but it's also like the hardest part because we actually intentionally make our programming so good. You have to generally try and f like split your friendship groups just to try and attend all the different things you're missing yeah. because everything is happening at one o'clock and you want to go to everything. And it's, it's, it's that good. And we found a lot of people have said that in feedback. They were like, you've had like five good things all happening at 1 PM. Like right. how, how, how am I supposed you? to decide? <laughs> yeah. How dare you like have all this happening? And I, I just want to, are you recording it? Like, you know, there's this people. Just <laughs> the number be one question we get, will this be recorded? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> Will you share the recording after? It's like, but this was this was pre-COVID, right? So this is before anyone was talking right. about Zoom to this extent, mm -hmm. ever question if it was recorded. It was like, if you were there, you were there. If you weren't, you weren't. Mm. Um, but now because of the kind of capacity of that, it's like constantly like, is this going to be recorded? Can I watch it back? Because um, I didn't want to miss out. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's being really clever with our programming and it's active listening through all the different channels that we're connected to, um, mm. the people, um, the social platforms, our community groups, our, our actual in-person events, and basically like creating this, I guess you can call it a database of, of, of data, of, 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 of insights as to like, what are the conversations that are coming from our community that they want to dive deeper into? Um, and how does that impact or entwine with the varying identities and belief systems and religious systems and everything that kind of feeds into this intersectional lens that we're trying to to take into our programming content. Mm, I love it. Mm. Yeah, for for those of you listening out there who have ever gone to a conference, yes, us conference organizers are evil <laughs> in that our plan is to make you have to choose between many many good pieces of content and conversations. Like that's how you know it's a good event if we always get in the feedback form as well. Like I couldn't go to everything I wanted to. We're like, we're sorry, but deep down we're like, yes. Yes, yes, <laughs> good. good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so apologies to all of our future attendees and past <laughs> attendees. Um, well, bef I, I wanna dive into that because I think there's something interesting there in how you source uh, mm -hmm. content and themes that you bring into your programming. Um, but before we do, I wanna make sure we have the foundation so everyone understands. Uh, what is Black Girl Fest? Uh, it, it's yeah. I know we know it's a, a festival, a conference. Um, can you talk about what what that event is and what else does Black Girl Fest do? I know you also consult with businesses, so just so mm. people understand the foundation of what we're talking about here. Yeah, sure. Um, so Black Girl Fest um, is a festival and platform dedicated to Black women, girls, and non-binary people. Um, for the first three years since we launched in 2017, we were hosting a big annual festival conference type space for black women um which is a mixture of talks panel discussions a huge marketplace with black women owned businesses selling their wares from everything from like books to jewelry to hair care products um and it, it's just grown and grown the first festival that we did the capacity of the building that we had was about 350 and we had about 3,000 people registered to come down oh my and goodness. <laughs> i know yeah and then the last one that we did in 2019 october we actually had the capacity of 3,000 people and it was probably the biggest and best festival that we've, we've done. Um, I would say we were the first, the UK's first of its kind and have been the leading space for and to have the, the basically the biggest platform where black women attend. Um, and then obviously with everything that happened in 2020, our constant question was like, how do we continue to engage with our community when we can't meet physically in person? We know our community so well that we know black women thrive when we are brought together in physical spaces. So not being able to do that was like the mm. big question mark. And that meant pivoting the business to think about how else can we actually intentionally support our community when we can't meet them? How can we impact their lives? How can we support their learning? How can we create access when we can't physically bring them together? 
Um, and that's why we started developing our platform and thinking about the channels of which we wanted to support our community through the entrepreneurship journey, through the creative journey, through the educational journey, and really assessing the ways in which we believe the Black community, but specifically Black women, are failed. Um, and by creating these channels, we want to empower them to see them succeed, to see them thriving, essentially, is how we define it. Um, so earlier this year, we created our Founders Club, which is a platform to support black women to connect and learn. Um, we define founders as self-starters, entrepreneurs, creative thinkers, creative entrepreneurs, however you want to define them. Black women are more seen as self-starters and they see themselves, they see themselves as self-starters before they see themselves as entrepreneurs. Um, black women are really good at just starting stuff. And what we wanted to create is a space that would teach them and give them the support, mentoring, skills, knowledge to make those things they start a success. Um, we know too well about the lack of investment, definitely across the pond, but in the UK for black women, black founders. And so this is the direct response to really, again, shake up the ecosystem and be really targeted and be really specific and, and actually try to support this community to thrive. Um, we run events, we have lots of community content, we do programs, um, and we are just really excited to see where this space will take us, especially when we think about the world opening up again and for us to be able mm. to do our in-person events and how that will, in this new hybrid space, would work for our kind of digital community, which is growing globally, and our kind of London, UK um, community over here Um yeah, in, in Britain. So yeah, that, that that's kind of what we do. And we work collaboratively with different brands, organisations who essentially want to engage with our community, but want to do so in an authentic way. Um, mm -hmm. And something that we're really eager in, in, in trying to do later down the line is really kind of expanding our work in trying to support more younger girls in higher education. Mm -hmm. um, and then later down the line as well, thinking about how we can support those similar to what we're doing with their entrepreneurial journey, but with their creative journey too. Mm, I love that. Yeah. All right, so I have some practical questions. <clears throat> so you started, <laughs> you planned on a, a, a venue for 300 people, you had 3,000 people. Um, <laughs> how did you start off with so much success? Did you already have a really strong network foundation? Was it just like you just hit a need that was so big that word of mouth just spread it? Like what kicked off the community in such a huge way? I think it was a bit of both. It was definitely the need within the community. Um, we were really pushing the headline of us being the UK's first of its kind because, again, so many people were saying they've never, they've never attended anything like this. It was an idea that we crowdfunded and, again, didn't have a social mm. media presence, didn't have a large following, didn't have any, any money. It was just this space is necessary. So many people wanted to see it happen. And those initial backers who kind of contributed, I think we raised about £7,000, those initial backers were like our first, you know, stakeholders, our first believers, the people who thought, we want to see this happen and we want to attend this thing, so we're going to put some money to make it happen. Mm. Um, we relied on our initial networks. We were just getting our friends to speak on panels. They were doing really cool stuff, working mm -hmm. for really cool organisations. And again, we couldn't really afford to, like, pay thousands of pounds for these brilliant speakers and fly them in. It was just... People within our community who were like close reach, who were doing really, really cool things in their careers and were great facilitators or had a small business and they wanted to sell in the marketplace. Like it was literally community led, community funded. And I think that's what's always been our, probably our biggest USP, um, whereas we've seen so many big conferences grow and grow based off big sponsorship and and you know have these incredible global speakers and industry leaders and yes although those those do bring in the tickets and they do sell it's always been the open door for if you're really good at something and you're really smart and this is your industry you come and speak you come and facilitate mm. you lead us you teach us what you know about what you have studied or worked in for all these years and i think still having that ethos of passing that torch down back to our community has made our space feel so accessible that year on year even a year where there is a constant a constant lockdown um our community members are still obsessively asking if they can facilitate a session mm. um if they can speak if they can um volunteer so they want a bit of work experience they just want to open closed doors they want to do the ticketing like it's 
an obsession. And I think it's because mm. we've built such a cult following that our community are just so eager to just be in that space. They're so eager to mm. be connected to each other in that physical space that we've created over the last three years that we've been doing the festival that it doesn't really matter to them that there's a global pandemic. It's just the fact that they're just so dire to be connected to each other again in that physical space. Um, so yeah, the hype is real. And taking <laughs> what was an accidental, uh, you know, hype generator into a business that was sustainable, that allowed us to do it year on year, was like the next challenge as a young kind of creative just also navigating the industry you know I went back to working full-time I went back to my day job after the first festival oh, wow. I was yeah. just like this was fun let me go back to my <laughs> job and yeah. it, it was only through like all the press all the attention and all the kind of constant push that we got from people who were like you've got to do this again yeah. did this really turn into something that we were like okay we've actually really got to do this again um right yeah otherwise i would have just gone back to my day job like i actually did yeah that's cool it's a good sign you found community market fit when people are begging you to do another one and quit your job yeah. Yeah. um so very cool so so you, when you say you crowd funded um did you so you crowd funded before you launched the event that's essentially how you funded that first event yeah we crowd funded to launch it it was just i think from the day um the space that we used, the space that had like 350 capacity, it was actually like a a local of, um, venue in East London. And they actually mm -hmm. approached me because they wanted me to do an exhibition. I done an exhibition in 2016. They were like, we'd love to work with people in the community to use our space because it was incredibly expensive and they're still going to give us a mm -hmm. space for free. And I turned oh, wow. around and I was just like, well, what about a festival? And they were just like, oh, okay, yeah, like, sure, run your little <laughs> festival. They didn't know what yeah. I was planning. That's cute. <laughs> That's cute. Like, oh, yeah, cool, cool. And um, yeah. and then, obviously, we didn't anticipate the cost of, like, you know, paying for extra security because we had queues for mm. hours, people trying to get in. And oh, my goodness. There was a point where the, the electricity cut off so people couldn't use the payment <laughs> cards to pay I've for the stuff. I've had that happen the, before, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. to pay for... Wi-Fi went down so no one can make car transactions in the marketplace. And yeah, and it was underneath these railway arches. So it was really dark and dingy, but it was, <laughs> it was perfectly imperfect. Like it was just, exactly. it, it, it had to be that way for us to learn. And yeah, so we crowdfunded um, the first one. We think our target was like £6,000 and we raised like £7,000. And I think it's still like, not the first, a lot to run an event. It's, of that not, a lot. it's, it's not a lot of money really at all nothing it's not it's not a lot it's not you know we thought yes getting the space free like that save us a bit of yeah. money and... yeah, that, i mean that helps <laughs> <laughs> did you charge for tickets too we didn't charge for tickets no oh, we wanted wow. to make it free oh, i know it was the second year that we charged for tickets but for us it was yeah. just like we've got this concept will it work let's put it out sure. there and yeah and it then, worked yeah, <laughs> it worked yeah oops <laughs> I love it. It, it reminds me like CMX had some similar things happen when we started it. We didn't crowdfund first, but we basically just started selling tickets before mm. we had a venue or we had anything just to validate. <laughs> and we're like, well, we fund people if we don't end up actually having an event here. But if people are interested, <laughs> we asked friends to speak and just came together. And I don't know about you. Yeah, it was, I love that. It was uh, imperfectly perfect. And it's mm. like, I don't think we're ever going to hit that same vibe and energy of mm. the scrappiness of that first event with all of its <laughs> flaws and all of its issues like that first event always has something special yeah no I totally agree I remember we ordered tote bags that arrived two days after the event <laughs> <laughs> and now you have 3,000 tote have, bags in your apartment <laughs> yeah of 2017 logo and it's just like what am i gonna do with this like yeah exactly video. that's why we stopped printing the year on a lot of our swag because we we're like no we gotta be able to use this next year next year <laughs> pro no, tip and swag don't put a date on it <laughs> <laughs> no it was so scrappy but i look back at it and just think like if we didn't do the scrappy way we would never like develop a system of doing it like perfectly and, and getting better at yeah. it and um yeah, exactly. sometimes you do have you to gotta go get it route. done you've got to get yeah, it done yeah exactly um, and yeah. so, okay, so it went really well. You started doing it annually. Did you ever raise money or have you still been completely self-funded and community funded? Um, completely self-funded. Um, I always, it's weird being an investor and absolutely loving being bootstrapped. It's, it's like, 
it's mm-hmm. it's something that a I'm, clash I'm of always identity. like <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a huge clash as well specifically like when I when I speak to founders and stuff and they're like they're trying to figure out if going down the route of VC investment is right for them or if they should just find like alternative routes of funding and yes one part of me is like yeah like this would be great yeah. like get some yeah. angel investment or like speak to this incredible like vc another part of me is just like just bootstrap like just keep being scrappy and keep enjoying that process and just live on the edge i think that's the addictive part about being an entrepreneur right it's just absolutely on the edge all the time um and i think that's what i quite like about this it's just completely experimental and as our community is forever evolving, I want this business to continue to evolve. I remember someone asked me, like, um, when do you think you would stop doing Black Girl Fest? And I was just like, well, when it stops, when it becomes obsolete, when the need for what we do isn't so mm. needed, it's just normalised. Mm. It's just, we're just included and our conversations are just happening around us. And <clears throat> until then, I've just got to keep doing it. I've got to keep experimenting. I've got to keep trialling things. I've got to keep evolving. I think 2020 definitely taught me that um, when everything you know of the way in which you do something is completely like flipped on its head and it's completely cut off. You've been so reliant on this one way of connecting and engaging with your community and you're kind of forced to find a new way. It just allows you again to just think on your feet. It's just like, how do I experiment and how do I trial something new to make it work? And I think that's mm. what I what I love most about being um, bootstrapped and just, um, uh, you know, really just focusing on what I can push out for the community um, and having all that mm. control as well, having that space to make those decisions and to to really feed into those insights that we've kind of built um, over the years of of working so closely with Black women. Um, yeah. Mm. Love it. And I imagine so uh, revenue comes through ticket sales now because now you sell tickets, sponsorships. Mm. You talked about helping businesses collaborate with your community and access them in an authentic way. Yeah. Um, are those the primary revenue channels? Yeah, they are. Um, and they were for um, most of 2019. That was, I would say that's like our, our best year. Um, we did the then we did a the festival that had like three thousand people and our hopes was to scale it up to ten thousand in twenty twenty. Um and yeah, mm-hmm. I think for us it was just constantly trying to find new revenue models to tide us through twenty twenty and also to allow us to kind of really scale in twenty twenty one, twenty twenty two, sorry. Mm-hmm. Um and so yeah, so building this platform, building the subscription membership model and thinking about how we can continue to support our community when we couldn't meet them in person was like adding more to that um revenue stream so that we can essentially do more yeah love it yeah it's ringing bells with um naj austin who was a guest on the podcast a while back um who yeah. started ethel's club and it was the same thing it went from like in person to uh having to figure out like how to take this co-working space and bring it online and turn it into a membership and ongoing yeah. online experiences so seeing seeing some parallels there yeah no i love naj she's really really cool i remember i went to I was in New York in March uh, 2020, just before everything went tits up, as they say in the UK. And um, <laughs> I met her for the first time. I was like a huge fan, like digitally. And I I was so adamant on meeting her and, and seeing the space. And she was telling me all about their expansion plans. And, and it was just really, yeah. really exciting. Um, and then obviously everything changed. And so I was just kind of... And I, I think I remember reading an interview that she talked about. Um, she calls herself like a builder. And I just found it mm. so fascinating that she defines herself as that first and mm. foremost um, and just constantly finding ways to build for her community. And I think that's just really powerful. But um, no, yeah, it's, mm. it definitely is a similar a similar fashion um, where we've had to kind of pivot a little bit. Yeah, I like that. And it's the language I used earlier when you described your community as, as builders, as mm. creators. And it's interesting because I think that's an important thing for all community builders to keep in mind. We often see ourselves as connectors and facilitators. Um, we even call it community building, community builders, but <laughs> we don't always think of ourselves as builders, right? It's more mm. about connecting existing builders, but the way you work, the way Naj works, the way I work, I, I think we all see ourselves as building things for and with the community, yeah. um, not just like making introductions between people. Yeah, totally agree. So agree. Yeah. Mm. I'm curious. So with the transition, I guess one question is now that everything went virtual, um, are you mm. seeing 
the community expand outside of London and the UK a lot more? Yeah, so over the years of running the festival, um, we've had so much interest with like fans in the US who have just constantly flooding our Facebook page with like, when are you doing this in the US? When are you coming right, to LA? Right. When are you coming to New York? What about so we, us? We, we don't had... get anything in the US. Yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> there's so many incredible big conferences, right? That, that yeah. I don't even know how I would even compete or just even attempt to <laughs> try to run. Like, do you know what I mean? And so the fact that we have people who are eager to see that and in Europe as well, there are so many um, communities across different par- parts of Europe who were just like, we don't have anything mm. like this in in this yeah. neck of the woods like you need to bring this here so i think when we went um digital it opened up to those communities who were like i can now get engaged with your content i can now attend some of your events and i can now get mm. in connected to us as a, as a as an organization as a brand so that opened us up a lot more and that was really exciting because again we were now thinking about time zones we were thinking about the kind of speakers that we could bring yeah. on board whereas it was always kind of like who was in our close neighborhoods it's now like thinking about like who is in those communities across europe and the us right. um so that was really exciting for us um and definitely uh, a challenge with thinking about how we continue to work with those communities as we kind of as the world goes back into what it once was um right and thinking about the future of the space as 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 we want to globalize as we want to connect and and now that we've connected to all these incredible global audiences it's like we're not just gonna cut off the, the phone line and be like okay bye that was lovely yeah um, back to we're thinking, <laughs> see ya <laughs> like it was great to get, see ya um we're thinking about again how do we continue to connect with those groups and what does that look like in terms of what right. we're doing in person and, and how we've been connecting with people um virtually as well did you find that that was a challenge at all for your existing community because the commu- the the community originally centered their identity as mm. being black women in the UK and in London specifically and now it's like broadening it and so mm. maybe you know is is that a a challenge for your existing long standing members to see that expansion I don't think so. I, like I was saying before, like a lot of what definitely um, the Black British experience lent on was what was coming from the US, right? It was stories, mm. pe- celebrities, it was news, media, protests, whatever it may be, we're all constantly just watching and learning and adapting and assimilating to some degree. And so I think for us, definitely what we've found for our community over 2020 is how we have all been not just globally connected, but globally switched on. We've been plugged into, and I always say like, you know, International Women's Day or month in March is actually meant to be a time of actually think, looking at the global experience of women around the world, but it always ends up just being kind of sub-communities of where we focus our, our attention right. on. And mm-hmm. I always, I remember I was speaking in a panel one time and I was just like talking about how Women's History Month is just become this space where we just think about the histories of women within our communities but we don't think about the women across the you know across africa across the us across communities that we don't even engage in and 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 hear from and Mm -hmm. i think definitely what has happened and has shifted is that we have been far more acute to the experiences of the global experience of black womanhood that we're all championing and, and celebrating and fighting for and protesting for women around the world who we probably have never or never know of but their story kind of impacts ours just by way of that shared identity and so something that we're seeing is that and this is something I've always said and I think it's on our website as well how um, our community are they're globally switched on they are acutely aware of the experiences that they have within their country but also they will champion and protest and shout for other women around the world because they are mm. other black women. Um, and so being connected to their, their stories and their experiences has now just spiked for us because of the lockdown period, because everyone was so focused online and, and so plugged into other people's experiences and how other people were, were dealing and connecting and, and um, navigating this new world that we were living in. And so there's, mm. there is something there really to explore because that's why I was saying like cutting off the phone line and it just being quite like, quite, quite harsh and just kind of abrupt. It's sure. more like finding a way to 
reconnect the phone line in a way that is still connected in some way, but not cutting it off completely because now that this connection has been made, our community will never want to cut it off. You can't ignore mm-hmm. the plight and the stories of black girls around the world anymore. And so mm-hmm. for us to constantly find ways to connect in that way, we as an organization have to make those connections live and direct with our programming, with our with our events, with our with our community groups and our platform. And yeah, so that that's a real challenge. That's like, oh crap, we've got a global phone line and we can't hang up. <laughs> <laughs> can't hang up yeah do, and i imagine you're going to start to do this <laughs> i imagine you're going to start to see like local champions who want to raise their hand and be kind of the community organizers and advocates for their local region um while being yeah. connected to the larger community yeah and I, I love that i think that's how you guys grew cmx having regional mm-hmm. and I, I think that's just so clever and it's just it's it's definitely the route that i want to go down and thinking about um, how how often I get asked by black women in, in 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 Amsterdam and black women in Berlin who were just like, when are you going to come and do this over here? And it's like, why does it have to <laughs> well, be why don't you me? Do it? <laughs> why don't you do it? Why don't you yeah, do something over there? Yeah, why don't you try to you busy do like in December? <laughs> <laughs> I don't expect you to do something for three thousand people, but maybe like thirty. I don't know. Like, what can you do? Um, well, so that, what's interesting that, is it starts with those small local ones, but then once you have a lot of people in, you know, in Africa mm-hmm. or in Asia, and then those regions want to start collaborating, all of a sudden you will have another three thousand person event. Yeah. Um, because yeah. all those local organizers start kind of meshing together and, f- and seeing that regional identity form. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that would be the dream, right? Feeling a way to connect people in that capacity would be like the most exciting next step and now that I feel like I don't know maybe it's because uh the times the tide feels like it's changing but suddenly feel things feel a bit borderless to me I'm just like where can I I go like yeah you know you haven't been able to travel in so long and you're just like I just want to go everywhere now um and I think that's how I'm approaching this I'm approaching like connecting to my community I'm like I've been following this person for like the last nine months in lockdown I've got to meet them I've got to connect with them I've got to work with yeah. them and I have like a whole list of people and I'm just like I've got to find a way to do something together yeah I love it yeah and it's going to feel magical when you do because it's all that pent up uh, uh, exactly. disconnection and virtual connection that you're like once you see each other in person it's going to be like ah let's, let's collaborate <laughs> yeah <laughs> so much community energy um, cool so switching gears a little bit here to think about kind of the impact that you're working toward with black girl fest and your work as an investor um we talked we touched really briefly on you know curating content and how you you pay very careful attention to what the community cares about and what's most valuable for them and you bring that into the programming at the festival as well as at smaller virtual events Um, I'm curious, like, how do you think about creating content and specifically creating content for black women in that, in, in, in how, you know, looking at the way brands today that may have good intentions and be trying to Mm. work towards DEI and B and, and support black women and make them feel included. Where are they doing Mm. this in the wrong way or where are they missing an opportunity to create content that can really connect with this community? Yeah. I always say it's so obvious when a brand or an organisation who's trying to be more diverse or trying to speak to a specific community hasn't put that community at the table to make the decisions, Mm. to design, to plan, to produce, whatever it is. It's so obvious. And I don't know if they know how obvious it is is to our community, but it's so obvious. Like it it reeks of non-inclusive collaboration like you could tell um it's inauthentic it's sometimes offensive it's disingenuous and it's fake it's false and it stands out like louder than them not doing anything at all like Mm. and I think we saw the emergence of that um definitely in the UK post Black Lives Matter post George Floyd post a lot of brands and organizations having to hold themselves accountable and putting up these statements and putting up these commitments and having this real plight to like change themselves 
And, you know, Black History Month, which has been a very commercial time of the year for us in the UK, was always, like, loaded with, like, the glitz and glamour, but never the real deep conversations that we were seeing when we came out of last summer. Um, So for us, definitely this year, I think a lot of eyes were back on these brands, organisations, like, what work did you do? What are you changing? What have you changed in this time? What have you learned in this time? Who are you working with now? Who works behind the scenes? And I think more people have become even more socially conscious to like these organisations and kind of putting putting their backs against the wall and being like, you're not doing a very good job at this. And um, And I think by way of that kind of environment is where organisations like ourselves and so many other organi- kind of grassroots, community-run, funded organisations fit really well um, in being able to authentically translate and make those bridges and connections and sit at those tables to really help and build better connections between brands and communities and, and businesses and grassroots and all these kinds of connections that want to happen, they want to make, but they just don't know how to do it. Um, mm-hmm. And I always say, like, don't do it yourself. Work with organisations who are already on the ground. Um, we mm-hmm. have the tools, we have the insights, we have the the bargaining chips, really. We have the power to make really powerful connections between you and our communities in a way that's actually impactful to their lives and not just tick boxing, which is what we saw a lot of um, in previous years, pre-COVID. And I think a lot of people were basically being pulled up on it, you know, last summer, where rightly a lot of organisations were being told, like, you know, you are undiverse and a lot of you know CEOs were stepping down because there have been all these racial issues. And I think it was... It was a reckoning. It was a time of, I think, our lives that I don't think I'll ever forget. Um, And, but at the same time, there was this really, really exciting and new opportunity to change. And I think that's for a lot of organisations, they saw that as being like, okay, let's take a step back and let's put something else in the driving seat. And sometimes on a good day, we're in the driving seat. (laughs) I love it. And you touch on it a little bit. It's something that I've, when talking about DEIB recently, I've heard kind of this, this narrative of businesses have been very focused on diversity, uh, mm. but not focused enough on inclusion and equity um, and belonging. Um, mm. And I, I take that to mean that, you know, especially to your point after George Floyd, it was kind of this huge rush towards, okay, we need to do something and a lot of them focus on diversity. Okay, we need to like become more diverse as a team or as a community. Mm. Um, but it seems like diversity is kind of the lagging indicator, right? Like you yeah. have to build a, a culture and a community that's inclusive and welcoming first. And then as a result, you'll end up with a more diverse community exactly. or diverse team. But like starting with diversity without focusing on inclusion and, and, um, and making sure it's welcoming and equitable uh, it's kind of missing the point. Mm. Absolutely. I think the, the acronym, like the wording should be changed around, right? Because <laughs> the order. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not in the right order. Yeah, I think organisations start with diversity and that's why we end up seeing more tick box scenarios where it's just like fill the room with people that have different religions and backgrounds and skin tones and then, yeah, then great, we've solved Magic. the problem. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like amazing. And it's like, no, you haven't solved anything. You've just got a bunch of people in the room. And I think um, a lot of organisations definitely across creative tech, in the tech, um, even the venture space, uh, are still trying to navigate, like, how to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. And this is why I say, like, you know, for a very long time, actually, um, like, DEI professionals were massively underfunded, massively disrespected. A lot of them weren't given like but basically completely disregarded a couple of years ago um totally. they were always lumped in with hr and professionals mm-hmm. weren't given the credibility to make all the, the budget to make real impact <laughs> um they were always seen as an afterthought and that's why another thing that i always think with this work is that 
for a lot of organizations it's like oh this DEI thing is always this afterthought that's lingering over like other kind of corporate business missions and it's like well no if you don't embed it as an afterthought and you just embed it as an every day you don't have to worry about this DEI thing that you think is is a problem or it's kind of hindering on you or you're trying to just respond to it because you've got a bit of bad press and so then you're just trying to be reactionary as opposed to actually working with it within your every day um and I think that's where a lot of organizations find the problems they try to find quick fixes and don't mm-hmm. realize that this work is long it's laborious and it requires the skill set of your DEI professional whose job it is to do this and who needs to be respected and well paid and given the provisions to make the changes they need to make within the organizations of which they're working with and it's only now that we're seeing um some really, really big execs who are being brought into some of the biggest billion dollar organizations to make those rapid changes because they've seen that, okay, if we don't do this now, we're going to be really in the shitter. Like, we're, we're, this is not going to look good for us. And, you know, we're seeing rapid hires across some of the biggest tech companies in response to the lack of diversity and the lack of, um, and, the, you know, the reports of, of, of mistreatment and just uh you know racial discrimination and i think the biggest slap in the face the biggest realization is that it's not an overnight fix it's it's work that is is necessary but it will take time and mm. i think it's it's understanding that that first and foremost before trying to you know put the salad tape over the cracks as we've seen a lot of organizations trying to do um, is how we can make really long term impactful change and where we can see equity as being like um, and, and belonging really being some of the key factors in this work um, and not just diversity pushes because we see that as just being panels on panels and um, <laughs> we see it as as again the cellar tape over the cracks and we don't see real long term change we just see quick fixes all over the place um, mm-hmm yeah hmm i curious do you, do you have any examples that you've seen of investing in a long-term strategy that has really resonated with you yeah there have been there have been so many small things that i've i've been really impressed by i think most recently um and i think they're probably one of the first organizations to not just be reactionary, but to actually think about themselves and where they are placed within the ecosystem. Um, I think Glossier was the one um, who stood out for me last year. Mm. Um, the letter that they uh, that Emily wrote, but really the positioning they took um, was to understand that as a beauty organisation, there are so many other black-run beauty organisations that don't get the VC funding, that don't get the growth and the mm-hmm. appreciation, and who need that support. And, you know, rather than doing like your bog standard statement, they produced this program um, to support black beauty businesses and thought, you know, give them the grant, give them the access, open the doors to our R&D, to our marketing, to everything they need to know to give them the, the, the right tools and the skills so that they can continue to build and grow in the midst of everything that's happening around them. Um, mm. And I think that's really, really brilliant work. It's impactful not just for um glossier to be actively doing something but it's more impactful for the communities of which it's trying to serve and i Mm. think that's the bit that's really key it's like we're not doing this so we look fantabulous we're doing this because this work is necessary and this work is going to change people's lives just by existing and you know the the same thing could have happened with i don't know another big beauty brand But I think because Glossier have always been so brilliant at focusing on community, it was Mm -hmm. a no, if if they didn't do something like this, I would be very surprised. You know what I mean? Because they've, they've been so plugged into knowing how to best use community building as a tool, not just for marketing, but product development for everything. Like they are the leaders in beauty, in community builders and in beauty industry. So it, it made so much sense for them to do something like this. Um, and I think as well, if there are other ways in which they're plugging into the other communities that exist within their kind of um, ecosystem, like what that would look like. Um, mm. So, you know, for 
that black community, it was it was the lack of investment, lack of access to capital, lack of access to support. But for other communities, maybe Jewish communities or um, South Asian communities, there might be other experiences or, or, or barriers of which they probably try to solve. Um, so I, I would be interested. I think for them, their strategy is 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 has been quite clever for um, what they're doing for the black community, but also how it works for them as a brand, as a business. Um, mm. And I, I'd be interested to see what else they do, really, because they're such brilliant community builders that um, it just makes so much sense how they can continue to build this impact, this level of social impact that um, really affects and changes their kind of their customers, their the community's lives. Um, yeah, and that that just felt like a glove. It felt so clever to me. I was mm. just like, yeah, that made so much sense. I love it. That's a great example. And, and I think like it's one thing to have a long-term strategy, but ultimately having the long-term impact means just doing it over the long run. It's, it's yeah. you know, continuing to show up. All right. If you made this statement, like, cool, that's, that's a good start. <laughs> but like, let's check in in a year or two years or three years or five years or 10 years and yeah. see how you followed through on that. I think there's a lot of businesses who like you know, made a quick shift and then, qu- you know, we're quick to pat themselves yeah. on the back and be like, all right, we're doing it. Um, when it's like, <laughs> well, you haven't been doing it. So there's, so it's impossible to say whether or not you're actually invested in the long run yet and you're going to yeah. continue to invest in it, but good, good. You're caring about it now, like follow through and do it over the long run and we'll, we'll yeah. see. Mm. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, last question before we move into our rapid fire question round here. Um, sure. But uh, as we look toward the future, um, of course, you know, there's many billion dollar companies have been around for a long time and there's a lot of work to do to kind of shift uh, the direction of those companies. Mm. Um, now we're looking towards the future. I'm sure you, you've kind of been seeing in your own community the like Web3 craze towards decentralization <sighs> and crypto and this whole new world and what people are saying mm. are like the next iteration of the internet and business, right? This whole mm. shift in power and how these things are built from centralized corporations like the Facebooks and Airbnbs of the world to, you mm. know, community owned. That said, um, you know, if you look at a lot of these projects and a lot of the ecosystem, it seems to be repeating a lot of the the issues that Web 2.0 yeah. did in its early days when it comes to um, making sure that the community is equitable and inclusive and diverse. And so mm. I guess I'm just kind of curious, you know, you have such an interesting vantage point on tech and culture and the mm. experience of the black community and black women in, in culture and in tech. What is your hope or what is your advice for kind of those who are building in this next wave of technology and this next wave of business to mm. avoid making the same mistakes and make sure that we're um, building an inclusive and equitable ecosystem that you know maybe maybe we can avoid a lot of issues that we had because we're, we're in some ways starting from scratch yeah I mean you you've said it already it's 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 that level of inclusion that isn't just seeing oh these are a percentile of people who don't exist who don't have a spending power who don't have a buying power who aren't builders who aren't creators um it's just I feel like for a lot of um definitely for a lot of like um black people they feel very much ignored they feel very much left out of these conversations and mm-hmm. I think as we've seen with um I guess you can call it old tech the old world like 2.0 is a lot of what has been built hasn't been inclusive of these communities and so I think what we have to think about in this is this new framework of 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 the future of the web is how do we actually reflect the world in which we live in um and that world is very very diverse it looks so vastly different than what we previously thought it did we can actually build something that is truly reflective and i think that opens the door to think again not just about the diversity but the inclusion first um, and what that world would look like if we actually included everyone, if we try to include everyone first um, and build systems, build processes that allowed for multiple voices to be seen and to be heard. Um, that feels far more exciting than, to me than trying to exclude um, people. Um, it feels like we would have 
the metaverse of all metaverses of 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 spaces where we would see um thriving communities all existing because we've opened the door um and i think definitely for black women it's just again like i said just wanting to be at that table wanting to be part of those conversations wanting to be the decision makers the creators the innovators because we we have the capacity to do it um something that i've seen across culture for many years is how you know black women are always at the center of every cultural moment that we see mm. across history like there's always a black woman involved somewhere along the line it could be the way in which technology's been developed product design whatever it may be music film there is always a story about and i see it definitely with every black history month that comes around there's always an innovator of someone who designed this or the first person to do that or the first black woman to do this and there's always a black woman at that story but her story is never really ever told and mm. she's never given the title of the genius innovator or the creator and it's always a sub story rather than the main story and i think um what i'd love to see more of is 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 more of those main stories it's more of more black women who are given those positions to innovate to create um for us but within the festival like stem even steam subjects are really important because we think about the way in which the world could look like if it was created by a black woman you know if it was created by black people like would we even have these conversations about diversity if the the builders and the coders and the engineers or the the, the computer scientists who were behind the the web and the way in which technology looks like were already black what would that look like what would that mm -hmm. space be if we weren't the afterthought but the main thought um and that's the world that i try i try to imagine sometimes and i try to get other people to imagine imagine it whenever we talk about um working together or thinking about how our communities can can form new like authentic bonds and i try to get them to imagine a world where black women aren't um sidelined and are put center stage because that's what we do with our festival we put them center stage and we're unapologetic about that and so to get people on board i try to get them to imagine this world where this this exists and so i almost feel like for us to 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 really kind of develop a a 3.0 that is truly inclusive and just truly reflective we have to put so many groups that were always backstage center stage um and that feels far more exciting to me it, it sounds like an absolutely crazy party and i feel like everyone should be invited and i think that and i think that's that's something that i don't know if we would ever see um but i'm hoping that there are enough kind of powerful voices in in the right positions to keep banging that drum till we do see it yeah i honestly i think we need more of that especially in web3 i like i think it's a, a space that's kind of been living in its own bubble for a while um and yeah. now it's starting to reach culture and reach kind of the mainstream more with nfts and DAOs yeah. and, and some of these new ecosystems Crypto. that yeah. yeah like regular people can get um but because it's kind of been uh working in in the background for a while there hasn't been the same sort of spotlight and attention to these mm. challenges and these issues or accountability around them um and so it's it, it was you know in some ways doomed to perpetuate a lot of the existing norms in society and maybe even go mm. backwards in some way from like web 2.0 companies that have a lot of attention on them and and yeah. A lot of this is like through like cultural awareness that companies are making change. And if culture is not paying attention yet, yeah. that change isn't going to be made. Um, yeah. But my hope is that now there's more cultural awareness. And because of leaders like you who have built your communities and your platforms, those are platforms that now do have power and do have influence and do have access. And yeah. just ba just purely based on your community existing, more black women will have paths to learn about web three and get plugged into those communities yeah. and and be connected to where power and influence lies and and because they're already builders they're going to look for opportunities to be the builders and be the creators in this new movement um and if that's the case then like the power will be dis redistributed that's that's my hope yeah. yeah no yeah i totally agree yeah 
Hmm. Hmm. All right. Rapid fire question round. <laughs> <laughs> I can riff on that for a long time, but uh, yeah, I want to be same. respectful of your time. We're almost at time. So we'll, we'll just have to chat more um, another time, yeah. but this is an yeah. awesome conversation um, and super important. And I'm yeah, just grateful for all the work you're doing and the example Thank that you. you've set. Um, okay. Rapid fire questions. I'm going to ask the questions in, normal speed and you're going to answer them rapidly you ready yes all right let's dive in first question what's your favorite book to give as a gift or to recommend to others uh why i'm not talking to white people about race by rennie and dodge why am i talking to white people about race why i'm not talking to white people about oh, why race? i'm not why i'm not why why i'm no longer yeah, so Reddy Edna Lodge wrote this book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, and it, it's just a brilliant book, um, and it tracks and talks about the history and the timeline of racism in the UK, um, but in a way that's just, it just blows my mind. There's just so much that I, even I didn't know, I wasn't, I didn't mm. learn about in school. Um, and she's lo- won loads of awards, she sold millions of copies, she's a brilliant writer and author, um, and it's just the perfect book just to bite size for anyone about race in the UK. Yeah. Awesome. I'm going to pick it up. All right. Next (laughs) question. If you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would that food be? Pasta. (laughs) Pasta is a pretty common answer to this question. I think we're, I don't know what it says (laughs) about us as as human race, but just pasta, (laughs) any, any specific sauce or topping? Uh, like pesto, pasta, cheese. Mm. I could eat that for the rest of my life. Yeah. I feel that. <laughs> yep, me too. Okay. Uh, what's a community moment you'll never forget? The first festival. It was yeah. when I was, there was like a group of like older black women who like held my hand and who were just like, this thing that you're doing is amazing. Don't stop. And I was just like, oh my God, oh my like, God. Who's, <laughs> whose grandma are you? And this is just emotional. And yeah, it was, uh, it was, I would just never forget that memory ever. I didn't know who they were, but they just believed in me. And I was just like, whoa, this is some serious stuff. I just cried the whole time. <laughs> that is the purest form of community market fit I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a really special moment. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Uh, have you ever worn socks with sandals? I have, yes. Yeah, regularly. Yeah. Is this a common thing, or just you know you tried it once? No, and... just just around the house. Does it count if I wear like my slides with my yeah. socks? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I might walk to the corner right. shop. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Why put shoes on? It's a yeah. Lot of work for the corner shop, <laughs> corner store. Yeah. All right. Uh, if you could sit down for coffee for an hour with one community builder, dead or alive, could be anyone. Who would it be? Oh. I don't know if she's a... I just... I always want to sit down with Michelle Obama. I don't know why. She's not really a community builder. No, she is. She she's started out before... Builder. Yeah, before she married Barack. Um, yeah, I read her book. Um, <laughs> yeah, I absolutely love to sit with Michelle Obama. Like, wow. That'd be amazing. Yeah, me too. Well, when, if you do sit down with her, if you could just say hi for me, maybe ask her if she wants to speak at a community From conference the podcast, sometime. I'd yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he wants to be a podcast guest, you know, small, <laughs> small community podcast. Just no pressure. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, which investment are you most excited about right now? Ooh. Um, can I say all my investments so far? <laughs> no, just... but I understand the answer. Uh, I'll just, uh, which one is like uh, exciting? You All of them are exciting. Which, which one's a, a fun all... one to share right now in the moment? I would say my first, my first investment, only because, mm-hmm. um, uh, yeah, I, I, it was like my first check, right? So as an angel investor, I was just like, this is someone who I truly believe in. I went out, out my own to, to find her and um, her business is just growing so rapidly and I'm just so excited. I'm, I always say like I'm, all the investments I've made, if I'm really geeked out about what you're doing, that's a really good sign. And I'm so geeked out about Ruka Hair. Um, they essentially create hair extensions that match black women's hair texture. And it's, again, it's just this product market fit that is so genius and doesn't exist mm. and doesn't make any sense why it doesn't exist. And it's just, it's so brilliant. And um, 
both the co-founders are really, really smart black women who are just so obsessed with community and so obsessed with, I actually gifted them your book. Um, hey. Yeah. I think I, I yeah. chatted with them recently. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Ten, did, did you actually? I think so. Yeah. Ten What's the name of the company Ugo. again? Ruka Hair. Yeah. I think I did. R-U-K-A. Yeah. Oh, I gifted them your, your book and they've just been obsessed ever since. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I'm, I absolutely love what they're doing. And, and I'm, a, I'm a fan. I'm a customer as well. Like I'm obsessed. Um, so it's just so amazing to see their, see their growth um, over the last couple of months. Awesome. Yeah, I did. I did. I got connected with them through Daisy. Oh, um, oh yeah, from Vogue. back. Yeah, and I love yeah. Daisy. Daisy's amazing. Yeah. Well, great, great overlap of communities. Yeah, very cool. And like such an obvious community driven business opportunity and um, yeah. a great example of where like, you know, if you think there aren't opportunities for investments and in, in business in the black community, you're just so wrong. Mm. Um, love that. Uh, I guess follow up question there, your, your very brief rapid fire version of what advice do you have for someone who wants to become an investor, but uh, doesn't feel like, you know, they have the identity of an investor, doesn't have access to that community, what would be like one or two steps that they can take? Find that community, build your network um, and utilize that because that network is very powerful, definitely for angel investors, anyone that wants to become an angel investor. Um, being connected to your own network is, is, is leading. It's definitely really powerful and it connects you to even more um, networks that can help expand your portfolio, but also expand like your relationship with other VCs and other investors as well. Mm. Love that. And do you find you were able to do that by building your community? Is that like the biggest thing? 120%. For you? 120%. Yeah. I straight away were like, okay, who, there aren't a lot of black investors. I need to know every single one of them. And I need to know every single mm -hmm. one of them that invested on the black founders. And we need to sit on cap tables together. And I need to go through deal flows with them. I it, it just made so much sense for me to lean in on that first um, because I wanted to actively invest in black women and I wanted to find other investors who were doing the same. So that wasn't hard because there aren't that many. But um, <laughs> in, the, in the UK, especially in Europe as well. Um, yeah. So once I did that, it helped me have access to brilliant deal flow. It helped me get access to more knowledge and to learn from other investors too. Um, and like I was saying, people like Daisy, like there's so many brilliant people in the ecosystem who are just actively working and I wanted to get connected to all of them. And so building mm. that network with all the virtual Zoom coffee meetings I had was like one of the, the most powerful and best things I ever did. Love it. Yeah. yeah, I think community building is like the ultimate networking hack. Like instead of you going out and trying to reach people, it's like build a community of them and all of a sudden now you're a leader. Here they are. <laughs> um, there you go. All right, a couple more. Uh, what's the weirdest community you've ever been a part of? Oh, I don't actually have lots of this. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I don't think it's weird, but um, I used to be part of this Sims. Basically, like I used to be part of this like Tumblr community that just loved mm -hmm. playing the Sims. Mm. It's not weird. Um, it's a little but weird. We just love building Sims houses. <laughs> yeah, hey, Tumblr, weird. Tumblr was a was a was a was a time and a place. Um, mm -hmm. But no, yeah, it was just it was just nice. I feel like Tumblr was like every scene kid millennials space yeah. to just like That's weird right. stuff. Um, we moved so, yeah. from live journal and dead journal into uh, Tumblr. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's and so funny. that's where I found my other sim loving community. Love it. And now we're all moving into the metaverse. So you are ahead of the time. <laughs> all right. Um, last question. If you were to find yourself on your deathbed today and you had to condense all of your life lessons into one Twitter sized piece of advice on how to live, what would that advice be? I really wanted to say a Drake lyric, but I'm not. Because um, <laughs> he has a lot of those verses that are like tweetable. Um, that would I be would okay. say, That's allowed. Yeah. <laughs> I would say, um, believe in yourself first before you need anyone else to believe in you. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. And I, 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 like I, can, I can give my explanation. I can say that only because um, I think there's a lot of doubt, definitely, for like, um, fellow builders about 
what we're working on, if it's going to work. You know, you trial and error things all the time. You're constantly feeding into different insights and data and trying to pull things together. And it's sometimes quite hard to believe in what you're doing because you're constantly trying to seek validation from other people that what you're doing is right. But sometimes you have to take the plunge, just believe in it. You have to believe in your own source and you have to just do it. And even if it doesn't work, mm. at least you know it didn't work. Um, but there's just so much external validation that goes into the work that we do that sometimes you get lost in actually just realizing that I need to believe that I can do this first before I before I get sucked into believing that I only can do this when other people tell me I can. Mm, I love that. Mm. Do you have any practices that have helped you hone in on that or really yeah. identify what it is that you believe in that you're ready to lean in on despite what others might think? Yeah, hundred percent. I journal loads. I kind of, I write affirmations. I, I make sure that when it comes to focusing on my skills and talents, definitely in this kind of social media driven world, it's so easy to get sucked into doing things just because you've seen another builder do it, or you've seen mm. someone else work on that, you know, I remember one point a couple of years ago, I was like, should I create a podcast? Because podcasts were getting like really hot. But I was like, mm -hmm. I don't want to create a podcast. And my community does not want to hear a podcast. So like, what's the point? Or like, should I get into YouTube? I've seen someone else do YouTube. And it's just like mm -hmm. really kind of focusing on your stuff is so hard nowadays. Um, mm. But I think the best way to focus on your stuff is to focus on you. And it's to focus on what you can do and what you bring to the table as a builder, what skills and talents actually work for what you're working on and, and honing into that um, by constantly like tunnel vision. And I think that's something that I've learned to do more of. Um, so like uh, plugging into literature and, and podcasts and video content that actually helps me to tunnel vision, and not get distracted by what's happening around me. And um I think that's how I continue to focus on what makes what we do special and what makes us stand out above the crowd from everything else that is existing at the moment. And um, yeah, I think more people should practice that for sure. Um, but yeah, even mm. if it's just like a little highlight reel of like all the things that you've achieved and that you've done over the X amount of time that you've been building this, it could be big or small, but coming back to that every six months and just really reflecting on how far you've gotten is just continuously putting positive affirmations of belief back into yourself um because once you go on that journey and I say like building is a long journey like you don't know if what you're going to do is going to work you just have to keep you have to keep putting into it no one's going to give you validation until the very end so in that time you need to keep believing in yourself and you can keep going yeah and so that's why I think that that work really seeps in it's really important um to become like well-versed and well accustomed to and comfortable with, with doing that um, because sometimes mm -hmm. when you only see that validation at the end, um, it, it draws a really un unhealthy relationship with this with this work that we do. And I, and I, I, I want to do it for a long time. So, yeah, I, I say very much believing in yourself first before you need anyone else to believe in you. I love that. I think the work that you've done and knowing that you did it during times of uncertainty and where there wasn't a ton of support and momentum around DEI the same way there is today, but you clearly followed your heart and believed in yourself and built something before uh, it was, you know, what other people were doing. And, and I think, like I said earlier, that's what's going to make a huge change now when we're mm. moving into new forms of innovation and new technological improvements with Web3 and all the stuff that's mm. happening, it's because of people like you that have built these platforms um, that there's a path now for people from underrepresented groups, for black women to, um, to be in a position of power, to have access to be able to be builders in these spaces. And so mm. just... You know, yeah, you're not at the end, but you're at a point already where you deserve a whole lot of um, appreciation and credit and gratitude. And um, thank, you. thank you for uh, coming and sharing all of your wisdom with us here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for the kind words. That really does mean a lot. And it's it's the, the pump and the energy that I definitely needed to carry on. So, no, thank you. I'm so honored. I'm a huge fan as I've said previously, um, of your work, of your writing, of your thinking. And, and so, yeah, it's a huge honor to be on this podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Well, I'm not a grandma, but, you know, I'll pump you up <laughs> the best I can. I can't do what they did. <laughs>
Um, and lastly, uh, where can people go to continue to learn from you and find you and the work that you do? Yeah, um, definitely find me across all social media, Twitter, um, Instagram. I love LinkedIn um, at N Crystal um, across my social media or at Black Girl Fest. Um, our website is also called blackgirlfest.com and just get connected with us. Say hi, come to one of our events, virtual, in person, tweet at us, tag us on Instagram and just get connected. Awesome. I highly recommend doing it. I follow Nicole on Twitter. Highly recommend get involved in the community <laughs> there. Um, I, as you can hear, uh, lots of good stuff coming down the pipeline. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. We will see you next time. Thanks.